two-part series on typography and technology, and I'm going to talk mostly about typography in this slideshow, uh, but also a little bit about changes in the surrounding professions and the technology that drove the, uh, the change in, in uh, type technology. And uh, so let's start. And what we talked about in the first film, uh, Gutenberg and hand-picking type, that was pretty much what there was until uh, these two machines were invented almost simultaneously hundreds of years later in 1886 and 1887 respectively. And the one on the left is an American invention, U.S. invention. The one on the right is a uh, British invention. And what they are are the linotype on the left it even says linotype up there, it's branded, and the monotype on the right. And these were machines that you could program with a keyboard, and the keyboard was detached in the case of this machine. It used sort of a paper uh, uh, tape, coated tape, to, uh, to feed the typing actually into this machine. This one had it, tended to have the keyboard attached. And the way this works is that this magazine up here, this triangular shape, piece is full not of type but of type matrices or matrices or molds uh, and what would happen is the typesetter and this is a bigger than your standard typewriter keyboard because there's one key for every possible character so there's a key for the uppercase a and a key for the lowercase a as well as keys for all the numbers and punctuations uh, would as the typesetter pushed those keys and they had no letters on them, you had to know where your keys were, uh, the matrices would shoot down uh, to a little viewing area here and the typesetter could look at the molds and the molds would be right reading because uh, they're casting uh, uh, mirror reading type for printing right reading. So uh, the, the user could read the molds and uh, see if they made any mistakes and then uh, send those molds off to be uh, cast in a line and that's what this machine did was it cast an entire line of type and that's where it name comes from is linotype line of type it created a slug this one created monotype just like was hand uh, uh, set before its invention but it did arrange it in a row and knock it out in order so you didn't have to do all the hunting and pecking around your case. You could hunt and peck your, around your keyboard instead. And both of these machines were used pretty steadily for the next couple hundred years, uh, or at least 150. Uh, I went to college in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and this is no longer true of that town, but at that time, when I was a college student in the early 80s, they had uh, both of these machines. In fact, they had a couple of linotypes, and they, had, uh, they were the oldest small newspaper in America at that point that was still printing using these old methods. So it did uh, sort of hang on for a while, and they had an old traditional press, and they printed it all out, and. Uh, uh, off a of flatbed price. And here is a row of people uh, setting type. Uh, there's quite a few of them there, so I'm guessing it's probably like a mid-sized newspaper or maybe a book publisher where this was. And typesetting, uh, uh, when I entered, it became a field dominated by women. But uh, back then, because it was heavy metal and, you know, uh, the magazine of the molds, uh, weighed, you know, uh, 50 or 60 pounds to pop into the machine. It was an industrial work. I mean, it, it was the, the result was books and, um, and newspapers and, uh, and magazines and stuff like that, but it was a heavy industrial job. I mean, there had to be uh, enough heat in those machines to melt the lead, and it, it was a big, you know, it was, it was, it was sort of, a, uh, it was in many ways just like a factory job, except uh, the product was type instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, cars. And here's a row of uh, the slugs that came out of the linotype machine. And if you made a mistake, you would have to reset that entire line and slide the old bad line out and put the new one in. And what this person is uh, doing, I suspect not really just for show, but is uh, uh, is sliding a piece of type in, and the way this would be read is you would print out a strip of paper of that row of type before it was arranged in a page, and and it would be uh, 
uh, proofread and then corrections were made and then these could be arranged into newspaper pages or book pages or however you want it to arrange them and locked up for, for manufacturing or for, for the long press run. Now you might be wondering where, and this is a terrible photograph, it was the best one I could find for this sort of process though, and you may wonder, and it also I think comes from later than the period we're talking about, but you may wonder where the designer was in while all of this was happening. Um, well, in many cases, the designer was nowhere. Uh, uh, there was just a lot less for the designer to do because uh, arranging pages was done with the big sheets of metal before, with the big uh, uh, frames of metal before uh, they were printed. And a lot of times, while well, newspapers probably had an editor that would work with the printers and decide which story had to go where and which was most important. But when there were designers, they were doing a couple things. One, they were just sketching out where things should go in kind of a vague sort of way. Or two, they were creating mechanicals. And a mechanical was probably used for something a little bit more complex, like this ad that this uh, designer is working on. Um, and if we go back to the galley sheet, what he's doing is taking galleys, and that's a cut-up galley. This happens to be a later galley, but, uh, but it's the best we could do. And he's putting it on the paper along with any art needs. Uh, and there are ways to uh, get those prepared. And it's called mechanical because nothing happens to it after, uh, uh, after it's made, except it goes back to the printers, the ones who are working with the actual type, and they use it as a guide to arrange that final page. And that's not ultimately the fate of this uh, process, but, uh, but it, for a metal-driven process, uh, that's, that's what happened. Uh, and here is a locked up page, sort of, anyway. I don't know if this was, a, it's a little bit funky because some of the type is running up and down and some of it's running seemingly the right way. And it's combined with a little bit of an engraving here. Now, uh, middle type was the only way to create type at uh, this time. And I guess we've uh, bounced up to 1820 now. That's a little bit backwards in time, uh, but uh, uh, it was not the only way to print. And all the ways of printing back then are pretty much the same ones that you are familiar with if you've taken a print class at Mason or anywhere else. You could basically print off of a raised surface, and that's like uh, 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 linoleum blocks or, uh, or uh, hot type or uh, uh, that sort of thing. You can print off of a... Uh, 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 engraved surface. Uh, that's done where you take the ink and you rub it all over the plate and then you wipe it off and where you wipe it off it stays where the plate is engraved but comes off the surface and then you take paper and you press it and the paper has enough capillary action to pull the ink out and then the printing method we're going to focus on mostly in this class is because it became to dominate uh, uh, the world of design and advertising is lithography. And lithography is, it just means stone writing, although most of it is done not on stones anymore, but on metal plates. And it is based on the principle that oil and water do not mix. And so if you take a, if you image your plate with something oily, uh, or um, that might be a lithocran, which creates an oily surface, and then you keep your plate constantly bathed in water, the ink will be drawn to where it's oily and will be, because ink is also oily, and will uh, not be attracted where the plate is wet. And lithography, you could do some things that you really just weren't practical with, with hot lead in the early days, one of which is color. And uh, you can make a plate for each of the colors, and you can run it through the press and get some sort of simulation of color. And note that this does have lettering in it, uh, but this is all hand-drawn onto the plate. This is not type. And it's doing things that you could not have done, well, you could have done, but uh, in a much more limited way uh, with hot metal type. And that includes the curves, and that includes the sense of three-dimensionality on this plate. Uh, so it's not the only way to print, but it is. Uh, but uh, these these ways of printing are all coming in. And the reason lithography 
catches on eventually, I think, is because uh, the other demand of printing is speed. And you get uh, faster printing if you print off of a cylindrical plate. And every one of these methods eventually had a way of converting it into your printing surface into a cylinder. And that includes uh, metal type, uh, a term I've not used yet, but was used to almost the beginning and another printing term that you've probably heard and didn't realize it was a printing term. In fact, you've probably heard two versions of this term and that is stereotype. Uh, that's the English term and uh, cliche is the French term. And uh, these terms have the exact same meaning in printing, but, uh, but but one was used in France and one of them was, was used in England and they've just caught on. And if you think about what they mean, a stereotype is something, you know, you've seen before, it's kind of boring, a cliche is kind of the same thing. Uh, but what they originally were is if you had a lockup, like I showed you in the last lecture of type, you have a lot of money invested in that in that lockup, that's a lot of type you can't use for something else. So if you had type that you knew you were going to want to use again, but you didn't want to keep it locked up in a chase, what you do is you'd pour hot metal on top of it and you'd create a, uh, a mold. And then you would pour hot metal back on top of that one and you would create a image that was identical to your original printing plate. And that is what a stereotype originally was. And so with a rotary plate, and uh, uh, it's just a rotary stereotype. It's, it's a stereotype that has been done on a flexible surface. The mold is a flexible surface and, it, and it's bent into a cylinder. And so you could run your hot type through a, uh, through a cylinder press with a roll of paper and you could print thousands of copies rather than hundreds of copies in an hour. So that made things like big city newspapers uh, uh, much more practical. Uh, and when I, uh, as a child, visited uh, the local newspaper, uh, that is how they were still printing in the 70s and uh, uh, almost to the 80s, or I think, depending on, on the newspaper. Uh, and I'm going to send a link, I've included a link in uh, this week's email about a short documentary, not at the Chicago papers where I visited, but the New York Times, which was printing the exact same way, uh, about the transition from hot type and, uh, and, and I think this kind of printing mag uh, method to uh, uh, different printing methods and, uh, and how that, that just changed the, print, the printing methods. So all of these had ways of creating a cylindrical press, a cylindrical plate. But lithography with its thin, flexible metal plates was just the most practical for this. And here is so, some examples of uh, commercial uh, uh, lithography presses. Um, each one of these, this is like an early sort of office size model or one for a small, uh, uh, copy place. Uh, here's a bigger one. I worked at a place that had one about this size. Each one of these is an ink unit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, down at the end. So this is a seven color press. And so that means you could have the four colors that you have in your modern printer today, but you can also have, well, fluorescent colors or, uh, or, uh, 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 metallic colors, or if, uh, the client, whose job was on the press had a specific Pantone color that was associated with their logo or a special blue that only they used, you could have that color too in one of those units. And this little schematic here just shows how ink rollers are thin and uh, distribute the ink and it hits the uh, plate. And then the plate then doesn't hit directly to the, it doesn't hit the paper directly. It, it offsets, and that's why this is called an offset press, onto a rubber blanket on a cylinder, and that transfers to uh, the paper. And that's why uh, this is called an offset press, and that's just part of the sloughing off of the water process. So 
The other funny thing about this uh, uh, that's different from most conventional printing that you would do is the plate is actually right reading. You could just read the plate just like it was the printed page, uh, but then it gets transferred to mirror when it hits the blanket, and then it becomes right reading again when it's transferred the, for, for the final time onto the paper. And the paper could rush through this press at you know hundreds or thousands of feet. Uh, per hour, depending on the size and the capabilities of the press. Oh, just one more example of a more of a newspaper size press. So now, uh, what was happening is this guy, our designer friend here, is. Uh, now creating something that's going to be imaged directly. It's not going to be remade in metal. Um, it's going to be photographed and then it's going to be burnt onto a offset plate. And so he is actually creating the art. And if the type is coming from hot metal, which a lot of it is, I mean, that's a big industrial process to make something that's ultimately just going to be photographed and then and then redistribute it and if you look at this this would not have been common in the era of the original mechanicals uh, but these are tapes and he's putting down i think a little piece of tape uh, to, and i'll show you a closer look at that in a minute and some of the other tools uh, people like this would have been used but those tapes have lines printed on them uh, behind him is a waxer and i'll talk about that when we get to the waxer picture and this is actually going to be photographed and it's going to be sent to this guy. And I should say, I, uh, this guy, uh, well, I, that's how I started my career, was doing that, uh, designing and laying out pages, sometimes following layouts other people had done, you know, hand-drawn and just make, uh, rendering them in type. And sometimes I was designing myself with, with stuff I planned, but that sort of uh, was part of the design process. This guy is, of course, completely gone. And this guy is also completely gone. And um, in class, when I mention this guy's title, I usually get a titter or two, but this, he is a stripper. And he, what he is doing is uh, he is taking the art that the designer or the production artist uh, converted. And uh, uh, eventually we just sort of in the shorthand went back to calling these uh, mechanicals, but they used to refer to them as camera mechanicals because that page would get photographed as a negative, and uh, and then that negative would be used to uh, to uh, burn and uh, develop a plate, just sort of like any photographic process. And what he has is a couple examples of these big negatives that come from that. And the reason he's called a stripper is because. Um, the photographs had to be broken into dots. Uh, ink is black and the absence of ink is white. And so, or the, whatever the paper color is, uh, if you're doing black and white printing. And uh, to simulate a continuous tone or grayscale, you have to break your image down into dots. And that has to be done with a different screening process. You have to have a screen that uh, you expose your picture through, your negative through, through the dots, and it breaks the image into dots. And then you have to combine them or strip them together. And so that's what he's doing, is he is stripping images into those holes. Those holes look like they're not filled in yet, but these have images in, and they're taped or, uh, or glued or, or, or spray, spray mount it to those windows, depending on the process uh, and depending on how careful it was. Uh, my school newspaper, we used to go to a press that used spray mount, and as a result, sometimes in the picture, you could see this sort of like glop of, uh, of residue that uh, was not in the original picture, but was a, a artifact of the, of the uh, spray mounting process. And uh, as with any black, and black room process, red tape blocks. So the red tape is coming in to combine these uh, negatives. And uh, if you're doing any sort of color work, you have to do this for every color that's going on press. So if it's a CMYK job, you need a set of negatives for every color that is going to be ultimately burnt on the press. And those colors have to be very carefully aligned and those so that they print in register and if you look at old newspapers sometimes or even old magazines you'll see pictures that were just not registered very carefully and they look blurry and off as a result so as a result of that and because uh, uh, printing is a fast industry 
these people, if they were good, they made a lot of money. A good stripper probably made six hundred dollars a day, and that's when six hundred dollars a day was was a lot. You know, was was a huge amount of money. I mean, lawyer lawyers amount of money almost, and it was for someone who had was a graduate of a trade school, but these guys are are absolutely obsolete and absolutely gone. There are none of them left. I've used to work with uh, uh, three of them at the press. I was learning how to do it a little bit, but uh, but uh, uh, that is all gone. All right, and here's just a closer look of at that tape. These are bags of the tape where they were supposed to be kept in because the edges were sticky. Uh, the edges could accumulate grime, and the grime, if it, um, if you didn't get rid of it, could show up in the print. Um, but this looks like a sort of a wobbly tape designed to create a decorative border between uh, rules, and you could see just a little bit of sense of the of the type that has been uh, taped down. And these are not necessarily in order historically, but just to show some of the process. Oh, and there's a picture broken down into dots. Uh, this is a fairly low-end camera. Uh, I've used uh, that kind of camera and also a little bit higher-end ones. Uh, and uh, that's the image broken into dot. A picture doesn't have to be uh, the size. You know, if, if the photographer provides it, a eight and a half eight by ten picture and you want it to be you know smaller you want it to be seven inches wide or five inches wide uh, what you used was a proportion scale like this i still have an old one sitting around and it works basically like a slide rule which you probably haven't ever used either but you just line up on the big circle uh, the on the little circle the size you want your picture to be with the size it is and in the window it tells you what percentage to mark it for and then this camera has a adjustable lens it goes longer uh, or taller the uh, negative media would go in the top there or or sometimes a positive media depending on how you're working uh, if you're pasting the picture down like our, our our designer friend before it could you could get a positive and just paste it right down or if you wanted higher quality you would have it get it as a negative and strip it in uh, but that's the wheel that was used and it was a camera like that that uh, 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 it would be shot on uh, uh, not not many jobs for camera operators of that kind anymore uh, stat cameras just another look at a layout um, Sometimes paste-up people would also be referred to as key liners, and this is a key line. It's just a indication to where the printer should cut the window to put the picture in when they strip it, or the stripper to do that. And these are indicators for the printer. These are crop marks. You can generate those right out of uh, uh, InDesign if you want. You can print your page with crop marks. Uh, and if you were going to a professional press, you probably would be. And that is a perforation or a fold mark. Uh, dotted lines were used to indicate both. Uh, I always had to write which it was that I wanted it to be, um, just in out of an uh, abundance of caution. And here is a knife uh, that we used to cut type up. And if the mistake was noticed, you would get the line and you would sort of uh, key it in, paste it in where it was supposed to be. And that is a waxer, uh, which put down a waxy coating uh, uh, on the back of your galley. And uh, uh, they smelled, the wax smelled a lot like uh, melted crayons. Uh, that's probably the only thing I miss from those days, uh, at least in terms of the industry, is the uh, smell of wax. Just one more layout. I don't know why I included the extra. Slightly nice, more nicely drawn crop marks. So, if you think about uh, creating metal type just to uh, recreate it as a flat sheet so that it could go be printed on offset, there was a lot of motivation and a lot of possibility for profit in the creation of type that uh, did not require that lengthy and arduous industrial process. Um, so here we have an early ad. And it says no type used in this ad um, and it brags that this ad entire ad was set in only 40 minutes and you know with the big metal machines and you know plugging in the, the uh, 
uh, magazine you want for the font you want. Yeah, it, it would be unthinkable that a ad with this many different fonts and uh, uh, dif different changes in it could have been created that possibility. And what it's talking about using is phototype. And this is type that is exactly what it sounds like. It is type that is imaged photographically. And uh, this was not the only way to create uh, type. Uh, there's one other I'll show you, uh, but was a big step forward for typography. Uh, well, not everyone saw it that way at the time. A lot of people thought phototype was a lot lower quality. Uh, a lot of people thought linotype was lower quality compared to hand type when it came in. Uh, there's always a bit of a reaction against new technologies. Uh, but that is a phototype ad. And here is the first phototype setter, at least as I understand it, from 1949. That's uh, uh, Oh, 13 or 14 years before my birth, somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, and if you look at it, you could see it looks a lot like the linotype that of a few slides back. And that's because it works exactly like that, except that it has it has the same keyboard. Uh, so someone, an operator of the one could go and become an operator of the other. And the same sort of uh, uh, magazine up there, except that it is shooting down uh, negatives and then these negatives are sent to an exposure unit and a line of type is exposed and the photographic material uh, advances a line to wait for the next line to go down and then it all goes through a processor another early typographer this one more adapted to uh, uh, modern uh, keyboard and this is why typography starts to become a much more female dominated uh, profession is because it frankly paid quite a bit better than being a uh, secretary, which a lot of women were in the 50s and the 40s. And, uh, and it, uh, it paid better and, uh, and uh, it used or at least foundational skills were the same of, of keyboards. Uh, Here's a more modern unit. I've used machines a bit like this one. Uh, inside that chamber is a disc, or a fancier one might have had as many as four or five discs, and each disc has multiple typefaces on it in the loop, and the disc spins around, and when the right letter comes around, uh, a beam of light goes through it, just like a photographic process, and exposes that letter. Um, but if you had a disc like this, a simple one like this, which probably only had one disc in it, uh, you were limited to the fonts on that disc. So if you wanted Helvetica to use with Garamond and those fonts just didn't by default come on the same disc, uh, you had to uh, custom order a disc uh, with your fonts on it. Um, some of these machines also use strips. There's a terminal. And you'll note that with this terminal, as with the next last one, uh, it's not a WYSIWYG terminal like you have now. Generally, you would code it sort of like a web page. You would say uh, you would just punch in a size, punch in a line length, punch in a justification, and you would start to type it. But this is, is it claims to be WYSIWYG, but it clearly isn't. We don't see anything like a uh, page. And out of most of these machines, especially the earlier ones, uh, what's coming out is single columns of type. Uh, it's not a page layout. It's still going to uh, our friend, the layout guy. Uh, this is two technologies I actually used. Uh, the thing about phototype is that you can uh, set type bigger, but the early machines probably still didn't get bigger than, say, 36 points. Um, you could... Uh, 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 go up and down, there was more flexibility, whereas a linotype probably was set to a single size. That's probably all it could handle, and you needed a different linotype if you wanted eight or nine. But with printing, uh, with the early days of printing, if you wanted a headline, you were going to a different technology. I'm sure you've seen some of the fonts in the Adobe collection referred to as wood types, and uh, a lot of early big types were carved out of wood. Uh, often by routing machines in an automated way, and they were combined with the smaller metal type to create uh, to create pages that might have headlines or things like that. Uh, this is rub-off lettering on the right. You'll still see that at Michael's. Uh, some uh, uh, scrapbookers 
use uh, special rub off lettering for their pages if they want color or a, or a certain effect or they want their type to be on top of physical photographs. I certainly use this in my youth. I also used one of these. Um, this is a photo typositor and it is, uh, she's holding up a piece of the product that came out of it and it's a little bit out of sight but what you'd have is a couple of reels oh no here it is right there is my reel of type and uh, you would have this couple of knobs right there and you would roll to the letter you wanted and by everyone who has been scarred by one of these i was just sort of mimicking the roll along with it and then you would have to loosen the uh the roll uh so that the the negative in the top of the machine would uh, drop so it would land flat so the type wouldn't bounce around on the line because it was of uh, uh, different uh, uh, tensions and different heights within the machine. Then you would have to hit an exposure and you'd have to figure out that exposure every time you ran the machine because it would vary depending on the humidity and, uh, and uh, uh, the temperature and the age of the chemicals and all kinds of other factors. And then you would have to uh, roll to the next character you want it and line them up carefully. You can't see it. There's a little adjuster to get the letter precisely where you want it. And then expose the next letter. And if you did it too slowly, your letters would be underexposed. And if you did, I mean, too fast, your letters would be underexposed. And uh, too slowly, your letters would be uh, overexposed. And so you had to just do it at a real even rate. And it was just a very tricky machine to get uh it's hands on to get your uh, get your a handle on, but it also uh, allowed uh, a distortion of type. You could angle a type, or you could squeeze it with lens lenses that could be installed between the negative and uh, the exposure material. And it also uh, allowed a lot of people to become type designers who never were type designers before. Uh, because if you had one of those stat cameras and the ability to make negatives, you could draw and create your own type machine for this. It was fairly low tech. You could just feed in uh, negatives from anywhere. The negatives tended to be taped together anyway. And so, uh, for example, avant-garde, uh, that, that typeface was originally designed for typography because it could be and it allowed a relatively small and low budget magazine also named avant-garde the typeface was named after the magazine to have its own custom display font uh, this is also a machine I used this was not a photographic machine it's basically just a fancy IBM typewriter IBM typewriters were in the 60s and 70s the gold standard for typewriters and this one just you had a special high-resolution ribbon and it had a uh, uh, triple pitch ball, so you can have type in three different sizes. Well, you'd have to change the ball and set, reset the machine. And it didn't do a particularly great job, uh, uh, but it also had memory, so you could type in and, uh, and uh, create uh, type. My school newspaper had one of these, and then we paid our printer to set our headlines for us. Now, a couple looks at some of the other industries. Um, uh, in the original days, if you wanted a color image, uh, you had to go to that camera or a similar camera, and you had to photograph that image four times through different filters. And so you'd get, uh, you'd filter out the part of the color you didn't want and get the part you did. And that's how you'd get a color separation. If you look at color separations uh, from the 40s and 50s, uh, the photographs are just terrible. Uh, and a lot, most ads were illustrated back then because the illustrator could, could paint painting in such a way that they could anticipate the color separation process and compensate for it a bit. Uh, but in 1957 comes the drum scanner and a machine for, well, what well, doesn't automate it, but it makes color separation much easier and uh, faster. And it's called a drum scanner because you put the, uh, the color item on this drum and you mount it to that drum couple ways to do that and uh, then it spins and it's read by a photo multiplier tube and that puts the color into the separations and that sort of revolutionizes color uh, in uh, in the late 
50s, color becomes much more accurate and much more high quality on press due to this machine. Um, there are still a very few of these around, uh, but this is also a profession that is mostly gone. If you were to go to National Geographic in town, they have a photo service, they have a, a photo studio, photo lab that does all their color for the magazine, but they also do jobs for the public, and they still have one of those for their photographers who prefer working with film, or, or uh, which uh, a lot of people still consider to be uh, better. Um, so the next thing that happens, and this is around the time I'm graduating from college, is uh, people stop imaging type with negatives and they switch to CRTs, uh, just like old fashioned televisions. A CRT is a source of light and so you just form the image of the letter on the screen. Uh, and this is not a very good illustration, but this just sort of shows how it works. And then it's that screen that, uh, that, that, that uh, images the film. And it's much faster because you could just, it's not a physical process. The computer just uh, forms the image and um, as quick as it can and, uh, and the paper moves along. And the earlier one of the, ones of these tended to have a series of lens to reduce the size of that image. And then later ones uh, uh, just had super high resolution CRTs that would image entire lines of type at once. And then of course, 84, a little bit before I graduate college, is Macintosh, uh, which was to become the dominant typesetting machine. Uh, in fact, Adobe only made software for Macintosh at first. It took a lawsuit to, for them to uh, support PCs. And that seems a little bit crazy now because they probably are running on more PCs than Macs. Uh, it's a lot of money they were sort of leaving on the table. But uh, Macintosh was the graphic design machine for most of its first 10 or 15 years. And that's why uh, uh, it, it's still dominating today is because it's what uh, people in the shops are used to. Uh, the Mac did not start as a typesetting tool. It was a little bit uh, derided, being so small and, uh, and not as functional as PCs. But uh, the next year, Adobe releases or I guess that year Adobe releases PostScript. And PostScript is a computer language uh, for, uh, and you can learn to write it if you want to. I knew a guy a long time ago who was crazy enough that he worked directly in PostScript rather than software, although he, he could do some interesting things that way that you couldn't do with the software at the time. And also the laser printer. And uh, I have a laser just to my left. I think inkjets are probably more common, at least in homes right now. Uh, lasers are a little bit more common in offices. This is just a black and white uh, laser printer, but Adobe PostScript is the language that is used to send the description of a page to this printer. And this printer has what's called a RIP in it, a raster image processor that turns that description into black and white dots. And the first uh, lasers were 300 dpi. That was as high as they could get. And type was a noticeably a little bit cruder, uh, but some people thought it was more than good enough to print with, and some people uh, sent jobs out of this machine to press. Uh, other people, oh, and there's PageMaker, uh, the first desktop publishing software. I never used PageMaker except uh, under duress. Uh, but you could also image your job, uh, you proof your job to a laser printer, and, uh, you know, photographic paper is expensive. It was about $1.50 or $2 a foot back then, and then all the chemicals for processing it. But you can proof your job on paper, get your job perfect on paper, and then you could set it to, send it to not a uh, typesetter, but an image setter. And the same description of the page, which might include photographs and headlines and, and everything arranged just as you would want it on a page, uh, no paste up, would come out of a machine that looks like this. This is, um, I used this machine for almost a year uh, earlier in my career. Um, that's a EGA uh, image center. And sitting there right next to it is the RIP. 
And this is a dark enclosed environment. Uh, paper is feeding inside of this into a can and that can lets you uh, then carry it to the processor and start to feed it in. You always have put a little bit of extra at the ends so you'd have stuff before the type imaged. Um, uh, and, uh, and you would get your full pages then. And stripping got a whole lot more boring when that happened because uh, uh, strippers were just putting together a lot of whole pages or maybe combining pages with pictures. Uh, but there was, uh, it, was, it was just bigger pieces to work with. Uh, but eventually, uh, machines like that are eliminated too. Almost nobody outputs type uh, to uh, photographic paper anymore. Any big press would have a plate setter now where you just image your page directly to plate. Uh, you either go directly to paper through a fast, you know, through a digital press. Uh, we have a digital press on the Mason campus that works just like a uh, inkjet. Um, and there are big digital presses. There are also uh, there are also presses that image directly on plate now. They're, they have basically a bunch of lasers uh, uh, built into the plate, and the plates are imaged right on press. Uh, or uh, there's also wet ink that uh, uh, processes that uh, work sort of like offset and have the same quality. But most most uh, printers are uh, are imaging directly to plate. And so all that stripping and all that, what used to be called imposition, arranging the pages so that they would print right in the right order, in the right place, all of that just comes out directly on plate. And that has made quality quite a bit better because there's no human factor involved in lining up colors and that sort of thing. It just comes out, every plate is, it comes out just about perfect.